Welcome to the third episode of Apple Finch Pudding, your gateway into the world of science. Today's co-host is Jeroen Bart, an amazing comedian and freelance engineer. He is a permanent and also the funniest member of the science podcast Nerdland and holder of the 2019 Golden Jacket Award. Hello, Jeroen. How are you? Hello. Uh, I'm good. I'm good. Yes, how are you? I'm fine. Thank you. So, holder of the 2019 Golden Jacket Award, how proud are you? Uh, still very proud. It is uh, displayed yeah. in my uh, in my home here uh, <laughs> at the uh, the coat rack. So, yeah, it has a very <laughs> prominent place in my home. <laughs> and how do you estimate your chances for 2021? Uh, I'm trying very hard, trying very hard. Like I, I, I lost it two years in a row. So no, no, one year in a row. So yeah. I'm going to go. Peter Beck's, I guess. Right? Yes, yes. But I'll get it back from him. Uh, yeah. Everyone's <laughs> uh, everyone's upping their game right now for the worst joke uh, on the podcast. <laughs> so we're trying. Yeah. Also, maybe important for listeners that don't know the Golden Jacket oh, yeah. Awards. What is yeah, it exactly? It is a, 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 it used to be a symbolic award, but then we made it a physical award for the joke that is so lame uh, in a podcast that it makes people say, go and get your jacket. You need to go outside and cool off for a bit. But uh, it is a joke. And it that's why a lot of jokes get disqualified for it. If the joke is too good, then it doesn't qualify because it really has to be like a bad joke. Like usually it's a pun or uh, a double entendre or something like that. It, it has to be really, really lazy. Uh, so yeah, we often make jokes that are way too good for it. So uh, that it's, it's only the, the, the lowest fruit that gets the prize. So do you really want to win it then? I mean, not really, <laughs> but also yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I get it. I get it. <laughs> And you're also a freelance engineer. Yeah. Um, what What does that mean exactly? Because I well, never heard of a freelance engineer. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> it is it is because I just can't decide what I want to do. Uh, so I okay. I write and do stuff for TV, but that's the comedy side. I work for Nerdland. That is some organizational side. But other than that, like I have an engineering degree. Uh, I can write a lot of C that is in in, in high demand. So yeah. sometimes I just want to do little projects that are full on engineering and that don't have anything to do with making jokes or being funny. Like ideally you can combine the two, but I know that I have a very specific profile uh, even within computer graphics. So yeah, I'm up for anything. So if anyone listening needs an engineer for a yeah. smaller project yeah. in yeah. between. Just, yeah, like I was working with a company that made uh, simulations for firemen. I can't say the name of the company, but like simulations, <laughs> like when firemen enter a building and they have to like uh, figure out, okay, which door to close, which where's the fire going to spread first. They used a bit of software that I wrote and I did some consulting for them, for them to integrate it correctly into their their existing framework so it, i just see where the stuff brings me uh so that sounds really stuff. impressive uh well it was just a small part of the software i didn't write the software but they used a very small yeah, part still... yeah it, i mean it's nice to see that software you write is being used in like yeah. in fireman simulations and in dentistry as well like like in real life it has a practical yeah, application yeah yeah, yeah yeah instead of just rendering rendering nice cubes yeah <laughs> okay and you also have a, an iconic dog, Poncho. Yeah, yes, 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 yes. yes. He's, He's with you now? Yes, 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 yes. Wait, I don't know if the, because I'm, I'm, I'm using oh, yeah, the, yeah. the built-in zoom, uh, <laughs> zoom blurry button. But yeah. Oh, yeah, there's Poncho. Apparently, the, you... the zoom algorithm also works on dogs. Poncho yeah. is <laughs> sharp and the, the background <laughs> is blurry. So, yeah, that works. No, 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 no. It's like I have a little dog and he takes me for walks a lot of times. That's because he takes when... you for walks. Yeah, yeah, as an engineer and especially as a computer engineer you're like behind the desk a lot of the times like maybe yeah. don't have to tell you that that desk work makes you a bit fat yeah. so uh, yeah it's nice nice to have a you're saying group. that i'm fat no no no, no. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just i'm just saying when you work at a desk for a few years i used to have like i used to like be able to eat anything and don't gain weight because i i moved yeah. like to classes and to activities but as soon as like yeah, i started yeah. having more seated jobs the pounds really really start to be yeah. visible so <laughs> a dog helps he also takes over your instagram account right yeah yeah i i don't have time for instagram so i i say instagram that's a dog's job yeah uh, <laughs> because like i like twitter i like just tweeting stupid little brain farts that i have but with instagram you need to have a visual with every one of those brain farts as well
well and like I don't have time or inspiration for that. So the only thing I take pictures of is not myself, it's the dog. So <laughs> <laughs> and your replies are also in dog language, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like of course, of course. Like he doesn't know Dutch. He, he only yeah. he knows a few <laughs> words. Uh, and I'm not gonna say them right now or he'll go crazy, but like that candy, that the Dutch word for candy, yeah. he knows yeah, that yeah. the Dutch word for stick is also very popular oh, yeah. because then he gets a little treat. Uh, which he is begging for right now, but no, that is gonna work. <laughs> and the Dutch Proud. word for going on a walk, or yes, for yes, he knows, yeah. he knows that as well. Yes, yes. Yeah. yes. <laughs> Problem is, like he's an older dog, I can't really teach him new tricks. So, like giving a paw or rolling over, that, yeah. that no, that he doesn't do that. He doesn't really look old, actually. <laughs> yeah, but that, that's because he's small. He, he was a pretty old okay. dog when we like uh, old. I mean, senior age when we adopted him. Like he's he's ten years now. So in dog, oh, okay. Like when you convert that from dog to people years, so there's a new formula actually because usually ah, really? uh, people just do it times seven. But for smaller yeah. dogs, you gotta calculate in the weight of the dog and the size because like larger dogs, they they age quicker. So luckily okay. he's a small dog. So I hope, uh, yeah. I hope he's still with me for a long time, but we'll see every day we make uh, the best day. Yeah? <laughs> That's already a cool fact that we need to factor in the, the weight. Yeah, of the size yeah of there's, the dog. there's a new, but I mean, it's still because also like there are dogs that are bred to make them pure yeah. race and that sort of stuff because people want a spotless dog of a certain race mm. and that, that i mean that's dangerous for their health as well because you get yeah. like every, when everyone's sisters and brothers uh i don't have yeah. to make a picture yeah <laughs> <laughs> and he's yeah like, a lot of those dogs have real headaches or yeah, reading yeah, problems yeah, pro and problem stuff. readings and stuff yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah so he's not a pure breed he's a mixed breed like he he, he came from an asylum in spain and literally on his little password it says mercado which is like mix or something like that so it's like, <laughs> i don't even people oh. keep asking me what kind of breed is he and i'm really like i don't know something small i guess <laughs> <laughs> okay let's welcome today's scientist which is mighty lee kunda an assistant professor in computer science at vanderbilt university in 2014 mighty lee was acknowledged as one of the rising stars in electrical engineering and computer sciences by the joint departments of mit and berkeley in 2016, she was recognized as a visionary on the MIT Technology Review's global list of 35 innovators under the age of 35. And in 2020, her research was featured on CBS 60 Minutes with Anderson Cooper. It is impossible not to be impressed by these amazing accomplishments, Maitili. So thank you for joining us. How are you? Doing well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Happy to have you. So the first question I always ask is, what is your favorite science joke or anecdote or fact? Um, this is a question for both of you, but I will start with Mighty Lee. Okay, well, I have one. It's a story and it's a true story. Um, so I was reading this book that was all about the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. And I love I love science history. And so this book you know, had all kinds of like great stories about the people there. So this story happened, I think it was 1946. And um, von Neumann, the mathematician, was there uh, getting ready to like build one of his super cool early computers. And so apparently he was interviewing this engineer from MIT as you know one of the engineers to actually build a computer, this guy, Julian Bigelow. So Bigelow comes down from Boston to Princeton um, and shows up at von Neumann's house, which is this you know, sort of stately Princeton manor house. Um, and, uh, and apparently there's this huge Great Dane like jumping around on the lawn. So Bigelow goes up to the door, knocks, and von Neumann lets him in, and the dog kind of squeezes through and goes in. And then um, they were sitting around in the, you know, I don't know, like in the library or study or something, having the interview. And the dog laid there for a while, and then got up and was, you know, roaming around the house and everything. And so apparently they went through the whole interview, you know, like, what is the computer going to be like? Like, what will Julian be doing? You know, what's the sort of idea behind the project and everything? Um, and then at the very, very end, uh, von Neumann turns to Bigelow and says, do you always travel with your dog? because it was just like some <laughs> random dog. A random dog. <laughs> so that is my current favorite science story that I've been telling everyone. Oh, that's a really cool anecdote. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. Okay, and uh, Jeroen, do you also have a, a joke or oh, anecdote? Your story was so... Uh, how, how should it's I say? It's hard it? to top that. One, so right? so classy, 
like all of yeah. all of the facts that like remain in my head are like stupid facts about animals like like the wombat has like like a uh, cuboid poop that that sort of stuff sticks in my sticks in my brain apparently they have like cuboid poop because they 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 don't see very well and if you have a cuboid poop uh, it doesn't roll away so they use it to mark their territory and find their way back home that's a stupid thing that stays in my mind but like everything that is funny with animals like i'm a computer scientist myself and we did like uh, computer graphics and at, at one point uh we had a t-shirt uh, with uh, Monte Carlo everything, which is like the integration technique they use to solve everything. It's basically like, oh, we got to solve something. Better go random samples and average them out, baby. And like, th- I like that kind of really in-crowd nerdy humor. But but like to the broader public, I think the crazy little crazy little animal stories are great. Like I got, I got one more. Uh, recently, it was discovered that octopuses, when they hunt for food, they enlist the help of fish to help. Like other fish oh, yeah. help the octopus to find food. And if the fish doesn't perform adequately, like the octopus gives it a little a little whack. So it just goes, boink, please. Work harder. Work harder, yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> the kind of science stuff that stays in my head. But yeah. more to computer science, it's the stupid nerdy jokes I like. Those are also allowed if you want to share one. Well, I have like a quotable quote. You know, I wish this would like catch on. So, you know, you've heard the one about um, a mathematician is a machine for turning coffee into yeah. theorem. So here's my original variant of that. A computer scientist is a machine for turning pizza into programs true true <laughs> that is true i just had pizza that's completely true yeah. <laughs> you know actually while, while we're quoting stuff uh, do you know the quote from bill gates that he said at one point that 640 kilobytes should be enough for everyone i wanted to quote it myself in some sort of presentation but apparently he never said that mm. that's a, apparently mm-hmm. an urban myth or at least he's working very hard to tell all the press right now that he never said that but i actually i couldn't find any proof of him saying yeah. that that's one that was in my head there's a specific name for things that everyone remembers wrong like star wars luke i am your father that's not the correct sentence is it the mandela effect or not yeah i think so so maybe it's something like that right yeah maybe what's the correct <laughs> sentence i thought that was the correct sentence you mean from luke star wars. Yeah. yeah i think it's just i am your father or something or yeah luke he removed the luke yeah oh, no. also i i think a nice quote on the site from Jeroen actually Uh-oh. um the chicken came first god would look silly sitting on an egg <laughs> I, I I used to like collect all of the funny quotes I had and put them in a little JavaScript file. So on my old school website, when you load the website, there's a different quote every time. Probably one of the first things I've programmed. <laughs> so it's not your quote? No, 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 oh, no, no. That's a shame. It would have been great to make that up. There, there's a great little book about the art of stealing, where like uh, great artists steal better. <laughs> Okay. Anyway, uh, Mighty Lee, I actually have a question for you. A neural network, what is that? How do you explain like a very basic concept within your field, a neural network, to a general public? That is a really excellent question. Usually I take the magic out of it. Like I say, it's just a bunch of matrices that are like multiplicated. It's tables of numbers that get combined in a very specific way. And that gives the impression that the system is smart, but it's just very fast. And it's good at multiplying lots of numbers that we humans can't do as fast. But that's, I feel like I'm taking away the magic out of it. I mean, well, no, I mean, I think there's, I wish we could take the magic out of it more. Um, it's funny that you say that because a couple of years ago, I remember telling my students in my, I was teaching like our intro machine learning class. And I um, I think I remember telling the students that I will know my job has succeeded when I see their faces fall in disappointment that that's all deep learning yeah. is. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's a bit sad as well. <laughs> that's I don't think I said that since that one time. But. but that's a cool duality because like at the one hand, it is not magic, but on the other hand, there still is within computer science, there is still a broader uh, problem of the neural network or the trained trained deep learning network still is some kind of a black box. Input goes in, output comes out. And there have been some introspection papers. I think Google had a few papers that try to visualize uh, like image recognition, what happens in, in each of the layers. But there is still a big, we train the thing and we train the thing and it has this percent accuracy and now it works, but we can't really explain why. How do you tackle that in your classes? Um, okay, hang on. Now I'm like stacking like three of your questions. On Sorry, yeah, I, 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 I ramble. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, well, let me answer. Maybe I'll answer the last one first. The term black box, when you use it to talk about a neural network, it's a funny term. It's kind of like when you're baking something that is very finicky, like some kind of fancy souffle. And like, you know, the ingredients you put in, and you know, you turn the temperature to the right temperature and all that kind of stuff. And like, sometimes your souffle comes out beautifully, and sometimes it just like collapses and is sad. 
So to the extent that there's some mystery there, I think that's maybe how I think of what black box means with neural networks. But the flip side is you actually do know all the ingredients that go in. I mean, you're the one who like built it. And so it's kind of a funny term. So I almost, I wouldn't, I don't know. I sometimes don't like the term black box. It's more like having a system and you just don't quite know how to characterize the operating envelope. Is the mystery in the complexity, would you say? Because it's like for a human mind, hard to like have the all overview. I think complexity is a great term. And especially if you really take like the precise meaning of complexity in the sense of like, you're setting up a complex system and you're running it and you're not quite sure what the outcome is going to be because the interactions are like, there's too much going on. It's the same with like, I think there's a lot of complex systems where you don't call it a black box if you know all of the primitive elements that are going in, but it's just, you know, you can't predict what's going to happen. Um, I mean, computer programs are like that. It's also an exercise. I actually do this with a lot of my um, AI classes. Like on the first day, I will have them all try to come up with their definition of artificial intelligence. And then basically like half the definition get knocked out right away because they've used the word intelligence somewhere in the oh, right. yeah. <laughs> so my definition of AI as like a you know as a technical discipline is studying techniques where they use knowledge representations plus search algorithms to solve complex problems and all three of those ingredients I think if you look at like the vast I mean there might be some kind of like edge case, you know, that doesn't fit that. But the vast majority, certainly everything I can think of off the top of my head has those three things. Knowledge representation in the sense that you're taking something in the world and you're creating data structures that reflect it. All kinds of data structures, you know, it could be logic, it could be neural networks, it could be, you know, anything. Virtually all of the AI techniques use some kind, like search is in there somewhere. Somehow you're searching. Um, And then the complexity part is you're searching a very complex way. Like basically there's a lot of possibilities in your search. Actually, I'm working on an AI textbook right now that's kind of built around that definition too. So it's something I've been thinking about. I'm sure you get slapped around the face with all the AI terms that the buzzwordy Silicon Valley people uh, try to maybe slap on your work or use your work. Obviously, we're in some sort of AI cycle. Every business is trying to incorporate AI. There was a report today that in Flanders, where we live, a quarter of the businesses already use AI in some form and growing. Where do you see this cycle going? going? Is this a bubble? Is this a craze? Is this something that will become more realistic once we uh, crash against the limits of the technology? Or where do you see, where do you think we are in this timeline? You have a lot of nested questions. Yeah. I'm I'm recursive question man. (laughs) Maybe to give some context to my answer, um, I'll show you my current phone, um, which is this. (laughs) Uh, Nice matrix flip phone. (laughs) Yeah. So I am worried by how quickly and drastically technology is being woven into all aspects of people's lives. So in terms of where we are in the cycle, I don't think I have any kind of specialized perspective on that, to be honest. You know, it was everywhere, you know, five years ago and then two years ago. And now it's like even more every, you know, it just keeps We keep seeing, you know, like the next product that has AI things built into it. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I just, um, I worry about it because again, this is like, I mean, this is not a new discussion by any means, but you know, regulation is really lagging the uses of various things. I'm really worried about technology and addiction. You're talking about social media or... Um, yeah, social media and games and just websites in general, you know, just kind of the whole thing. Um, and just and also like reliance on it. So in my work, I do AI and cognitive science um, kind of in equal parts. A couple of months ago, there's just started to be a few studies about what reliance on GPS navigation does to a person's spatial skills over time, you know, and uh, there's just a handful of studies right now. I mean, it's certainly there were, you know, most of them are small, um, small studies, but at least, you know, this handful of studies seems to find that we do see sort of attenuation, let's say in people's you know, spatial reasoning and spatial skills, once you've been using GPS for a while. And it makes sense because, you know, navigation, getting around in the world is like the most fundamental things mobile organisms do. You know, it's like from the, you know, from the little things swimming around in the ocean, to us it's just like our sense of 3d space is like so fundamental um and i mean certainly you know we still walk around our apartments and our or our houses and you know we walk around our you know workplace and things like that but uh but you know it's there's no question that you know everybody having their gps out when they're driving which is you know a lot of people in the world spend a lot of their time driving um and you know it's changing you know like what your brain is spending Mm -hmm. time 
one. And so, yeah. And also just in general, some people also look to their GPS when they're going a place that they even know where it is, just maybe to find the shortcut, but they don't think about it. Just look at the GPS on their phone and they follow it. Right. And I mean, of course, you know, like I think technology is, um, I always think of that phrase double-edged sword, because of course, you know, we could list a hundred reasons why GPS is awesome. And we could probably list like a hundred times that it actually saved people's lives and like helped, you know, like it's, there's no question for a lot of these things that there are benefits. It has also caused accidents, like people who <laughs> riding with their cars downstairs because they just say, take a left. Did, yeah. did you did you guys read that about at some point Google Maps drew the uh, border between Nicaragua and Costa Rica wrong like it was a couple hundred meters off and it led to I think Nicaragua invading Costa Rica at some point because they planted a flag on the piece of land that they thought actually rightfully was theirs and then Google apologized and like, they retracted it, it it's a stupid okay. example but that's something that that's oh, it's a good example when you were talking about like when people get used to GPS there are a lot of things that I think are basic that are eroded by technology right now um and I don't find that a positive evolution because like mm. i'm gonna sound like i'm 34 but i'm gonna sound like a real old man right now but when i had to work with a computer i actually had to understand how it worked internally not how you make like silicon from sand but there was some deeper understanding and i have the impression that with all the modern technology and all the comfort we get that the deeper understanding is completely lost because it is never needed and when the comfort is taken away people are totally helpless gps is an example i think it's also where the generation i guess that also remembers when we bought the first computer the first computer yeah. in our house i still remember i was about six or seven years old and yeah. we bought the computer and yeah. you had to learn how to work with it generations now they are born with a tablet in their hands yeah. to help father with the admin <laughs> yeah <laughs> don't think yeah. he ever did much admin was me playing wolfenstein 3d probably but yeah yeah so do you have any other examples of like recent um studies you did where there is a rift between people who are like glued to their phone and people who, who live less like you don't have a smartphone people with a smartphone are different do you have any more examples of that um i mean i'm not off the top of my head and you know we are just kind of getting started on some of these projects um yeah. like i study visuospatial reasoning yeah. um and uh, it's basically you know kind of how we think about mentally rotating objects and putting them together and things like that and one of the things that we have been looking at is you know how are those skills learned as a little you know as little kids like we kind of play with stuff and we learn them um but we're looking more closely you know how does that learning actually unfold so this is something we haven't you know we we're sort of we haven't actually like done these studies yet but we're working with some developmental psychologists so there's a developmental psychologist named Linda Smith at Indiana University. And she was one of the first people who had this idea of putting head cameras on babies. So then you actually see like, what does the baby see? Like when they're, and it's, it's just a super funny and interesting, you know, it's like, um, and, and, you know, there's their visual world is very unique. And a lot of that has learning value. But of course, then, you know, if we look at nowadays, screen time is like replacing, you know, some of the real world, like object interactions. And so, yeah, so that's something that, you know, we, we haven't done it yet, but that's one of the questions I want to kind of look at. Because you were talking about visual and, and spatial research. One of the more interesting papers I saw recently, it's already from 2018, was a paper for like a problem in VR right now is we have good VR goggles, but we don't have like easy treadmills that allow you to walk in every direction. When I play Half-Life Alex here in my living room, I'm going to bump into some furniture at some moment. And there is a paper from NVIDIA that uses the saccadic movements of your eye. There, there are certain moments when your eye is turning where you are temporarily blind. Your, your brain fills in the gaps, of course. And they use that to make a user believe that he is actually walking forward or has freedom of movement, but they slightly correct his movement by changing the images during this saccadic eye movement. So when they're blind, so they can actually like walk in circles in a room and still think they're going straight inside VR, which I thought was a super cool idea. It's so low tech. That's so cool. Yeah, that's something that came to mind. Sorry, I know the podcast is not quoting cool research at each other, but yeah. But it's allowed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And I think, you know, one of the things that I um, have learned when thinking about, from thinking about, you know, like infant, you know, child development and things like that is that, um, you know, a lot of times like we, you know, half of what you can study, if you talk about screens, I think like half of what you can study is like, what is the input that a kid is getting when they're on the screen? So then you can talk about, you know, like the addictiveness or, you know, just like the con, you know, there's lots of things. But it's just as important, I think, to realize that, you know, a baby has, you know, 24 hours a day, well, everybody has 24 hours a day, and you're sleeping for some of that time. But if you're basically, you only have so much opportunity to learn. And especially in childhood, the like the periods of development 
are sort of really important, you know, that they happen sort of like at the right window. Um, and so any time that you're spending on one activity, you're actually taking away from another activity. And so I think that another piece of the screen thing is, is what are you losing by not, you know, sort of interacting with the world? Yeah. Like I had this funny sort of personal realization. So I have these, you know, these are like the headphones that I use. I, you know, a lot of people probably have these. And I always just like wad them up in a ball and like stick, I guess many, uh, people who have AirPods now don't have this problem, but I always just wad them up in a ball, like stick them in my purse. And so then every single time I pull them out, it's like in a knot and I sit there, you know, and I, I was thinking to myself a few times, like, oh, like I need to get, you know, one of those windy things or maybe get the wireless kind or something. But then I had this funny realization because you know, I studied this kind of reasoning. Like, I mean, it's just like physical exercise. Like you have to exercise your brain you know, to keep the skills mm -hmm. and make them stronger. And I, it occurred to me that like every time I have to untangle this thing, that's actually like a really nice little like spatial reasoning exercise. You know, it's like unstructured. It's like kind of yeah. complex and it's, you know, it, it takes me what, like, you know, like 30 seconds to do it. Um, but it's like doing good stuff. So now I actually sort of like, I don't come grumble about it in my mind anymore. And, and when I pull it out in a single, I just think to myself like, oh, this is my, you know, this is my like spatial reasoning crunches for the day um, where I just, you know, spend some time on it. But I think that's the kind of thing where I think if we give too much to technology to make things easier, you know, we don't know right now what we're going to be losing out on. You talk a lot about like little visual puzzles. Do, do, does your research touch video games at any point? Because that's a, a field where I'm interested in, because a lot of people see video games still as, okay, you shoot the zombies, zombies go down. You shoot zombies or Nazis, that's video games. While there are so many really clever, cool puzzle games that play with visual perception, that play with problem solving. And there is such a world that is unknown to a lot of people. Any thoughts? on that is there anything like you maybe you like or, or if you have experimented with no video i mean and i i i love video games too in our like zoom era i'm just kind of like you know screened out sometimes now more than i used to be i think but uh video games are quite interesting so there is and has been for a while actually quite a bit of research showing that video games actually do improve some of these visual and spatial reasoning skills for exactly the reason it's because you're getting like practice with those kinds of things so then i immediately ask well okay if you're playing video games, there's certain things you're getting that you wouldn't get if you were just like playing, you know, something in the real world, like uh, you're getting, you know, these more complex environments. And sometimes like really the stories can be really, you know, immersive and compelling. You can use your creativity, there's social, you know, there's all, there's a lot of really good stuff. You're missing out, I guess, one big ingredient is physics. Yeah, haptics. Yeah. Haptics, yeah. yeah. Maybe also for the general public, haptics or? Oh yeah, um, I think physical feedback, haptics, like when you punch a guy in VR, you want to feel your hand connecting with the guy. Or oh, sorry, when you're yeah. when you're sorting blocks in VR, I always make it too, too, <laughs> too gruesome. Too violent. Like, yeah. that, that's what's missing right now in VR. If you hit the wall in VR, your, your hand just yeah. flows through uh, the empty yeah. space, hopefully. Because you've got the visual feedback, you've got the auditory feedback. And I've seen systems where there is some kind of like smell feedback. Uh, it's just one of the missing feedback uh, loops in, in virtual systems. I'll tell you one thing that I do worry about with games. One of my old friends who is uh, also a, one of my lab mates in the PhD, his name is Josh Jones. He had this observation about how games have evolved. Um, Cause I'm also like a big fan of like the classic games, like, um, you know, Zork and some of the, like the old like text-based um, things. And he pointed out that in a lot of the older games, if you kind of think of it as upload to download, like your upload bandwidth was like pretty high. Like you were kind of imagining a lot of what yeah. was happening and you were, mm -hmm. and you used to do puzzles and you know, all this kind of stuff. And your download bandwidth was really low because it was just like either words on the screen or really simple graphics. And he was wondering, you know, like if you look at a lot of the games now, it's kind of flipped, right? Where the down, like you're getting so much information, but then your sort of input, your cognitive input into the game. Um, is decreasing. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so, you know, like what is, you know, what does that do? And sometimes, you know, and again, I mean, like I said, I mean, this is also partially just like my bias. Um, you know, I, I sort of like the nostalgia of the old games too. Um, but I also like that, you know, it, it's more like, I guess it's like reading a book, you know, versus watching a movie. Similar analogy holds. So you make a lot of visual puzzles and uh, solutions, but you also work on AI. How do you combine those? So, yes. So um, the unifying theme of my work, I would say, is that I look at, you know, what are the computations taking place in an intelligent system for it to do like complex visual reasoning? 
and spatial reasoning. And, okay. you know, if we're talking about that intelligent system being a computer, then it's like, well, can we, you know, sort of like write systems or, or develop systems that can do crazy things? Or if we're talking about that in people, you know, our theories of cognition are like fundamentally computational. Like that's like the, you know, the, the current like paradigm. And so it's, yeah, it's kind of trying to like think about and pick apart, you know, like what are the programs that somebody is running in their head when they are, you know, solving some of these types of problems. I know some people have some sort of injury where their geospatial awareness or their ability to reason about 3D space is severely impacted. Do you have any experience with like people who are sensorily limited? Because often they make good research subjects because there are some constraints unluckily already in the system. Yeah, it's a really good question. A lot of our research actually is kind of coming from the opposite perspective, which is we do a lot of work looking at people on the autism spectrum. Right. And many, not everyone, but, you know, a, a good number of folks on the autism spectrum will sh actually show superior skills to right. neurotypical people on certain types of, you know, like reasoning tasks. Um, so we've been studying a lot of these tasks from that perspective for a while. So, so to give one example, there's this task, one of the ones that we've studied quite a bit is called block design. It just crossed the hundred year mark. It was invented in 1920 by this guy named Coase. And uh, it's, it's, it looks really simple on the surface. It's like you, you just, you see a picture, you have these colored blocks that sort of have, you know, shapes on them and you have to put the blocks together to recreate that picture. And even though it's so simple, like basically for the last hundred years, this has been one of our sort of primary measures of a person's overall visuospatial ability. If any of your listeners have ever taken IQ tests, it's like you might have done a task like this on the test. So it's still, you know, part of standard IQ tests. And there's a ton of really interesting. So, you know, just on this task, a lot of the patterns the kinds of patterns that you're talking about, you know, show up. So for example, um, a lot of studies show that both children and adults on the autism spectrum will be either faster or more accurate on this task. On the flip side, there actually is a lot of work, uh, you know, kind of over the decades, people have looked at how basically block design performance in people who have had certain types of strokes or who have other types of brain damage. And it turns out it's like really sensitive to a lot of those things too. And it's like the thing that I find fascinating about it is you'll look at these studies and they'll say, you know, people with this particular type of brain damage tend to make this type of mistake. And it's like a really, it's like one of them, for example, I'll just kind of describe this to you. So imagine you're putting your blocks together and you're forming like a square grid, you know, so you're putting, let's say nine blocks and you're putting them in three rows of three. And you don't actually know, there's no grid on the table, but you know, you can see the picture and you have nine blocks. So, you know, you're supposed to put them in a square. There's a type of error called a broken configuration error, which is when somebody will actually put a block outside the square it's supposed to go, which totally, I mean, to us, it seems really, it's like, why would you put a block outside? But it turns out that people with like a certain type of brain damage tend to make those kinds of errors. And so you have these studies that make that observation, you know, this type of error is linked to that. But what's really interesting to me is like, what is happening in between, like in their reasoning program, what are the lines of code that have gotten changed that are leading them to make that type of error. And so that's the level of explanation that I think in my research we're really trying to go for. So it's kind of like you have these findings from psychology and neuropsychology, and then you know we're trying to sort of connect the dots and sort of say like, what are the actual thinking processes that are happening that lead to those kinds of things? Is that more or less like the black box you were talking about before, and now you're more or less trying to open the box and see what's inside or something? Yeah, 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 that is a great analogy for it, yeah. You were talking about all these neurological processes. Are you also well versed in the actual neurology or are you more about the software that's running? I'm more software. That's software. a good analogy. Yeah. 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 I, I sort of leave all of the, the <laughs> wetware to the, the neurobiology, I guess. <laughs> because I, I read a lot of research that just goes, okay, we've shown people a lot of pictures about guitars. We put them in an MRI. Turns out there's a bit of a brain that really likes guitars. And I'm like, this is not research. <laughs> There's also a lot of DNA research, right? That they're just a big pool of all different people. We have DNA samples and we check, oh, they those people like blue and they have this small yeah. piece of the DNA that's similar. So that's the piece that makes sure that you like blue. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm glad, you know, it's like, I mean, this is how science is, right? Like you're glad that there's scientists working on all of that other stuff. And we just, you know, we kind of pick the things that we like, <laughs> I guess. In the yeah. end. Yeah. And interdisciplinary, that's the future, right? Because people are getting so specific that you lose a lot of the overview. That's something we talked about already in a previous podcast, but it mm. is true, I think, and especially in your work as well. Yeah, I think so. And I think it's also like, sometimes there might be a solution to something in another area that you like don't know about. But I also think 
think there's another thing that can happen, which is there might be problems in another area that you sort of should be working on, but you just don't know that they even exist. Oh, yeah. And it's, I mean, it has to do with kind of the perspective and sometimes you just have tunnel vision. I really like thinking about animal cognition also. Like, you know, it, it, it's like from a, from a cognitive science perspective, I'm super interested in, you know, like in people and people from different backgrounds and like children and, you know, non-human animals. And if we ever find aliens, I, I think that will be really fascinating too. Um, but uh, there was this, um, I can tell you like one of the, um, uh, one of our sort of lines of research started out with something I saw an orangutan do at the uh, Atlanta Zoo. So I was visiting some other researchers who were like working with the orangutans. And they had these touch screens that they would kind of like wheel up to the orangutan enclosure sometimes. And then the orangutans would do some little, you know, psychology studies about like face recognition and things like that. Of course, for little treats. Um, and uh, so then they were they were showing me one of these and it was this um, this male orangutan. He was um, it was basically like a matching task where he would see a picture and then there would be a delay and then he would see four options and then he had to pick the one that was the matching one. So it's like simple, you know, and he was actually still learning to do the task like they do this where they sort of teach them the task for a while and then they give them like the real one, you know, the, the real test. So he was in the learning phase. And I remember, um, you know, we were just like watching him and uh, the orangutan, he sort of so that, you know, the first picture showed up, he saw the options and he picked the right answer and it was like, fine, he got his like food treat. Then the second picture showed up and then there was four options on the screen and he picked the wrong one, but he touched the same spot on the screen. It was like the top right quadrant. It was like the same place that the previous one had been. He touched that, it was like wrong, you know, too bad. But then since he's in training, they would do this thing where what they would do is they would actually get rid of two of the choices to like make the problem easier for him. Um, and then that way, you know, he sort of learns the point of the task, you know? So they got rid of the two choices. Um, and they, you know, it's like they so try a little bit spatial here. They got rid of like the top right and bottom left so that what was left was these two. And so he should pick between those two, right? So you think like, okay, now he has like a 50, 50 shot of getting it right. Even if he totally forgot like what that earlier thing was, but can you guess what he did? He tapped the empty space. Yeah. He touched that same empty space yeah. where that thing had been. And, um, and it was funny too. I mean, you know, this is another thing I'm totally guilty. Like, I know you're not supposed to anthropomorphize, but sometimes it's really hard to not do that. And he was, it was not like accident, you know, it was, he was very much, he looked like people look when their phone freezes and you're like getting madder and madder and like yeah. jabbing more. So he clearly thought that he should be getting his food, you know, um, when he was yeah. jabbing that spot. But I saw this and it was so interesting to me because it made me realize as AI people, we really instantly carve up the world into like, like we're so used to thinking of the world and, and tasks in terms of problems and the options available to you. And so if you handed any AI person that whole setup, and you're like code up this problem for like a system to solve, immediately they would have coded up in the second, you know, after the two options disappeared, they would have immediately coded up that there's only two options left. And it's like, oh, you have a 50-50 chance of solving it. But that example was really interesting to me because it made me realize, you know, in fact, you know, it's not that the orangutan has two options or even four options. Orangutan actually has like an infinite number of options. I mean, he could do anything. And like, how does the orangutan even know that touching First of all, it's like that touching, you're supposed to touch the screen. You're only supposed to touch it with one finger. And, you know, like, and how do you, you know, it took me a while to think of how I would even define that. But it's like, you know, any contiguous non-black region of pixels is like an option, you know? Like, it's yeah. not like the okay. black stripes that are between the options. And it's not like you have four things, but it's not like you just touch the screen. Anyway, you know, those are four distinct options. But it's like, why? It's because, you know, they're because they're pictures, I guess. And um, it made me realize how much intelligence how much processing goes into even figuring out what the problem is let alone yeah. you know actually actually solving it and so this is actually kind of a problem that we're working on in our lab right now and we're calling it nonverbal task learning the problem is you know given a sort of continuous open world with a lot of possibilities how does an intelligent agent carve that set of possibilities down to like the smaller set that you should use for your task. And that's actually where most AI research starts. It's like, you have 16 options. What do you do? You know, like that's kind of the starting point of a lot of our techniques and everything. Um, but, you know, there's this other sort of translation piece. I think it's also really interesting because there are more solutions to the problem. Like you said, he touched the black screen. He could also try to touch 
maybe if the same picture as the first image was there, he tried that one because that's the one he recognized from before and that one worked. Right. So it's really cool. And how do you actually dilute that to the right solution? Mm -hmm. And it feeds into human research too. You know, like in our research, we look a lot at intelligence tests. And, you know, the same thing actually holds for human intelligence tests. Like there's the concept of multiple choice is a very <laughs> sophisticated concept. Um, and we learn that so early, you know, in, you know, for like those of us who have grown up in sort of like industrialized societies, we take tests like, you know, from, from really early on. There was a really unfortunate period of research using intelligence tests where people were taking it to countries where, um, you know, or taking it to societies that did not have these kinds of industrialized upbringings. And then people wouldn't do well on the test. And they were using that to, you know, make racial conclusions about intelligence and things mm -hmm. like that. And so, you know, so I guess, I, you know, this isn't just about, you know, like animals and people and machines, you know, there's a lot that we don't know about culture and cognition and, and so much of it's so automatic and so implicit, but it's all, you know, it's things we learn. I also heard that IQ test you should only use actually for children because it's not that relatable for adults because there are other variables that are more influencing. That was originally developed to see how far along the child is in his development of certain tasks or recognitions. And for adults, it's not that representative. I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know about that. Like, I'm also not sort of an expert in psychometrics, which is like the field yeah. of you know, how we how we measure things about people, you know, psychological constructs, I guess. But um, one thing I do know is that you're not meant to practice taking intelligence tests. And, and it's, again, you know, it's, this is also kind of, it's like interesting from an AI perspective too, because um, if you think about it as something that you're not supposed to practice, then it's essentially a test of you come in with the knowledge that you have and then you're really flexibly having to apply your knowledge in like new situations on this test and so it's a really kind of a test of your like dynamic problem solving abilities whereas if you practice it I mean you know practice makes you good at things too that's like a different set of intelligent yeah. capabilities but you know that's it then you're then you're just kind of measuring something different so it makes me think of video games now because you know so much stuff that you know like playing like Candy Crush is like really similar to some of the things that intelligence tests ask you to do. So I'm sure that if people are practiced on that. Um... That reminds me of something you said earlier, the invasion of technology into our lives and the way something is designed. A game like Candy Crush, there are like presentation about this that is designed to give you some sort of a dopamine hit to keep you coming back. I think those, those systems and using those systems in a commercial market is one of the biggest problems that we're facing right now in technology, that a lot of technology and a lot of services are inherently addictive, that are like designed to make people addicted to it. And I think regulation on that sort of thing is, is way overdue. I fear those things more than the killer robots or whatever the stress du jour is. But I assume it's really hard to get a metric on that as well. How addictive is a game? How, how would you quantify that? It's an excellent question. I'll tell you the analogy I have been thinking about a lot lately. I think it's a lot like food because there's things that are junk food that are deliberately manufactured to be addictive yeah. mm -hmm. and they are delicious. Like I, for the rest of my life, as long as Taco Bell is in business, I will be going there for my yep. occasion, you know, like Doritos, Locos Tacos, yeah. like amazing, you know, <laughs> like, um, but, uh, um, but, you know, it's like they say moderation in all things. And um, the way that we do that with food is we have nutrition facts labels exactly what you're saying. Like we, you know, there's ways you can sort of, and you can look at the ingredients list, you know, the, the government sort of regulates that you can know what the ingredients are and you can know what the nutrition facts are. And there's nothing like hidden or secret there. So then you can sort of decide. I think it's the same uphill battle we're going to be fighting with technology as we're fighting with food right now, you know, like making sure people are sort of educated and empowered and like have the resources they need to like make healthy choices. And, um, Because in the last years, you see that like the big phone operating system, Android and, and iOS, I guess, have introduced some sort of human well-being tools or whatever they call it. And they're basically like little reminders that say, hey, you spent three hours on Facebook today, maybe give it a rest. Does that actually work? I don't think it's ever going to be a one size fits all thing. I mean, just like with food, I think food is a great analogy. And also with food, I think it's also important to note there are lots of different cuisines and diets that you can like be healthy with. I think there's not a single right answer as to what is the right balance. And then there's also not going to be a single right answer about how do we motivate people. You know, like for me, something that works is when I think of it as exercise. Like I said, with my example, with like the earbuds thing, you know, it's hard to make yourself exercise too. So like, you know, that's not a perfect solution. Um, it also reminds me, you know, there was something I read a long time ago. It was back when they were trying to do these campaign. I, I mean, of course, this is also still an active kind of concern, but uh, campaigns to 
help kids not start smoking or to help kids quit smoking to kind of, you know, fight against like the advertising and everything that was coming out of um, the tobacco companies. There was one of these studies that was done by a nonprofit or something, and they found that kids kind of like, you know, I think they were looking at like middle schoolers or something like they don't like being told what to do all the time, but they don't like being taken advantage of. And so one of the best campaigns that they came out with was all focused on how the tobacco companies were using manipulative advertising practices and things like that. I think for me, I think about that too. Like, you know, sometimes when I'm on there, I think about like, oh, like such and such company is actually just trying to like keep my eyeballs here to like line their own pocket. You know, that is often true. It might not always be true, but it's kind of, it, you know, it helps me sort of. (laughs) The, the, The quote I always recall to is something from a Facebook report that was leaked like last year was angry people click more. That is the whole business model of Facebook. Anger is one of the easiest emotions to evoke. It is the emotion that has the biggest, I think they called it action rate. People who tend not to write anything on Facebook when they're angry, when you can get them in an angry moment, they write something, they participate. And a lot of Facebook's ways of working are built around evoking really basic emotions easily. And it's way easier to make someone angry online than to make someone happy. It's making kind of a depressing Black Mirror vibe here, but I think that is also a problem that we need to solve. I actually didn't know that they tried to invoke anger. Well, they won't say that publicly, but when the metric you're optimizing for is time eyeballs are on my platform, you inadvertently optimize for these things. A lot of tech commentary that I have is people often put complexity between themselves and decisions. We have optimized for time on the platform. Okay, the result is that we're encouraging young people to do stupid things and we're doing that and we're encouraging racism. But all of that is in our black box algorithm that we designed. We didn't mean to do this. We we just optimized for an outcome. Isn't that one of the problems with AI that you just ask it to solve a problem, but you don't put the constraints on it that you know, yeah. but the, the algorithm doesn't know? The bias in the training set, I'm sure that you know lots of examples mm. of, of systems that were designed to help all people, but were somehow very discriminate to black people because the data set yeah. that the but model Face was recognition with, and stuff, right? Yeah. I also worry about something else. I mean, this is, this is related, but maybe like a slightly different, um, a slightly different angle. Um, I also worry about sort of the push towards normalcy, maybe. Um, Oh, yeah. There's an idea of normal. And it's, you know, this is something I also like, I wrestle with this. So I'll tell you like two examples. This is like fresh off my mental presses. I've been thinking about this for like the last two days. (laughs) Um, When, you know, the, the pharmaceutical companies develop like prescription drugs, they're doing that based on this like sort of normative view of like humans. You know, it's it's kind of like we gave 200,000 people like an Advil and it helped their headache go away. And so then I'm like, well, I'm just going to like take an Advil and, you know, I'm going to hope that, it, you know, that's like a good thing. And so in some ways it makes sense. Like, and that's a powerful thing to be able to like learn from one group of people and then sort of extrapolate to yourself. That's like, great. You know, I love Advil now, <laughs> but, you know, I think that sometimes some of the examples, like, okay. So the other example I was thinking of is suppose you have a scholarship program for college students. You only have so many slots. And then you basically look at people's high school records and you find that, oh, students who sort of had this particular pattern of achievement in high school, they're going to tend to do well in our scholarship program. And if you students, you know, showed a different pattern, then odds are once they're in the scholarship program after two or three years, they're going to like quit. And so, you know, so we should prioritize the students who had the the first achievement. I'm not sure if I really think that's a good idea because it's like, you know, just because a hundred thousand students did things one way. And if you're the hundred thousand and first student who comes along, like, do you really want to be knocked out of the running just because the last batch of students did something about that bothers me? There's a very cold optimization in that you're optimizing for having people finish the scholarship. That's the one you're optimizing for. And you're assuming that the normative patterns of past students are the best you know are what you should be going for but isn't that what we're very often doing in science actually we're looking at averages what is happening in a population and we're leaving out the extremities not always but often right yeah it's true i know and you know i think the reason i even it's interesting my my path towards thinking about these kinds of things is very much from doing research on autism because in autism there's you know for a long time there has been this tension in the community between, you know, like to what extent you want to help folks on the spectrum sort of adopt or be able to sort of, you know, take on like normative social interaction that, you know, kind of live their life one way versus, you know, there's a neurodiversity movement now that seeks to sort of recognize that different can still be fine, you know, 
um, and it's, you know, again, I mean, it's, it's super complicated. Especially with the autism. Like I didn't know a lot about autism, but we did a podcast about it and the whole neurodiversity movement. This was all new to me. For me, autism, mm. I know there was a big spectrum and I thought, okay, if people are unable to function in a society, then that's a problem. But everything else is workable, I thought. But I didn't know like the immensity of the spectrum and all the different flavors, I'm probably using the wrong word, that there were to it. And it really opened my mind. Yeah, there is a the spectrum is. And, you know, I think on sort of some of the extreme sides, there are people who really suffer a lot. Yeah. Um, you know, because of their autism and their families um, and, you know, people around them. And so there's no like one size fits all solution. Yeah, because my sister works with children who have autism and she had a child and the parents were divorced. And for some reason, the child only wanted to eat orange vegetables with one parent and green vegetables with the other parent. But he didn't want to eat any other color of vegetables with the other parents. So they found nothing else about using food dyes to have them eat their vegetables because otherwise they wouldn't eat it. And like you it's a really wide spectrum and some people can function normally and some people have really specific problems and mm -hmm. it can be really hard. There's a saying that I heard, um, I think it's a common saying in the autism community about um, if you've seen one person with autism, you've seen one person with autism. Yeah, that's a really good saying. One of our projects um, right now, we are developing an educational technology to help teach middle schoolers on the spectrum, this sort of class of social reasoning skills that are called theory of mind skills. It's about reasoning about other people's beliefs. And so we have also, as a lab, we've been learning about like some of the design practices in computer science and in HCI, human computer interaction are really kind of evolving. You know, instead of designing for users, there's a push towards designing with users. Yes. Um, and a lot of these methods are called participatory design, where, you know, you bring people in right from the very beginning and you talk to them. Um, and actually, in our project, we did this. We did a study. It was a year or two ago. You know, we, we basically had a bunch of kids um, and their parents come in. And as we had them sort of test out, you know, some different technology and activities. But then we also just talked to them about, you know, the kinds of things that they would like to see in this kind of technology. And, uh, and that was really interesting. We just actually, we just published a paper that was summarizing kind of the parent perspectives. And then uh, the, um, we had this one really interesting interaction um, with this young guy um, who, when he was trying out one of our, one of the systems that we were sort of testing, um, he, you know, he got frustrated and he kind of had a little bit of a meltdown and, you know, it, it took him a few minutes to calm down. But then later we were talking to him about it. And he, um, he said, you know, I really struggle when I get frustrated and I'll have these meltdowns and I really would like it if I could learn to, you know, sort of control these. He was so self-aware about this particular yeah. challenge. And so we actually ended up designing this whole section of our game it's called the Relaxatron Arcade. And there's like this robot called the Relaxatron. Uh, and the robot like teaches you sort of mindfulness things. So it's like, if you get frustrated, like here's what you can do. And so we sort of deliberately added that in. You know, that was something that we were not, we did not realize that, you know, so many kids on the spectrum would like that kind of help, you know, when they're learning. That's really cool. And what are actually the specific problems that you're working on? So yeah, you work with AI and people on the autism spectrum, but what are some specific questions that you try to solve? Is it possible to explain? Sure. Yeah. So, um, so the project I just mentioned is one of our big projects right now. Um, and the uh, cognitive science AI piece of that, on the surface, it's like an, a fun educational game, you know, for teaching kids these theory of mind reasoning skills. But underneath the hood, I think what makes it interesting is we're essentially trying to teach about sort of complex social situations and social interactions in a very visual way. And also like almost modeling social interactions as a complex system and sort of being able to explicitly talk about those kinds of relationships. And so it's, it, it, it was sort of, this is what passes for like humor. And, you know, when you're a scientist is like, oh, I like, you know, I started out with this grant, um, which we got funded, which was to, you know, sort of build this educational game. And then suddenly I find myself like coming up with like a th working computational theory of social reasoning as like a stepping stone along the path to developing this game. And I'm like, how did, how exactly did I get into this situation? Uh, it's a very hard problem, but, uh, but anyway, so that's, that's, um, that's one example. Another project is we're looking at how do visual and spatial skills relate to employment? And we started out with a focus on looking at sort of employment for folks on the autism spectrum. And this idea that, you know, like some people might have sort of unique strengths or abilities that would make them, you know, super valuable to the right employer. But can we identify those and sort of, you know, help with that? 
that job matching. But more broadly, I think, you know, it's visual and spatial skills are really important in our everyday life. And a lot of research in education has showed that they're really important, especially for STEM. So like, you know, all kinds of math and science and engineering really pull on your visual and spatial skills. But it's kind of a funny puzzle if you think about because, you know, when's the last like visual and spatial class that you took? I wouldn't know, actually. Well, I, <laughs> I, 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 I studied computer graphics, so there was some spatial... A little bit, but, you know, bit, yeah. you, know, maybe, you know, maybe in preschool when they put all those colored yeah, blocks yeah, in front of you. Yeah. But for as important as it is, yeah. there's like remarkably little sort of explicit assessment and training that happens. You know, if you think about like in the US, we have like the big standardized test for high school students is the SAT. It has like math and verbal. I think it has like writing too. But, uh, but there's no, you know, there's no visual and spatial, um, you know, even on the, the sort of aptitude test. So I think that there are a lot of, <laughs> there are a lot of problems. <laughs> For example, when you look at diversity in STEM, that's a problem, right? Like clearly like that's not working. To what extent are visual and spatial skills feeding into that? I'll tell you two other compelling pieces of research. One, and these are sort of like robust findings, you know, across like lots of studies. One is that males tend to have spatial skills advantages relative to females. Why that is, you know, a whole yeah. host of reasons mm -hmm. we can talk about you know, including, you know, for example, like who gets Legos when they're a kid and who gets. Oh, yeah. 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 And then um, and then the other, though, this is kind of a, like another interesting and, and super exciting finding from the last few years. Spatial skills can improve with training, even as an adult. So to the extent that those might be a barrier for people, measuring that and, and sort of putting into place training programs and everything could actually, you know, have a really huge impact. And you're also, again, talking about averages and averages don't say everything about specific people. That's yeah, for sure. For sure. I think that the professional ethics and sort of practices are really lagging the field. Our societies are so complex now and there's so many layers. You have professional ethics. If you think about like the medical profession, you know, there's professional ethics and there's like licensing boards and then there's laws in place and then there's laws that protect patient privacy and, you know, all the kinds of patient rights. But, you know, it's like all, you know, this huge web of stuff. Yeah, I just see in technology, we just were at the infancy of that. Yeah. that. And then we also see that it's often a problem that even if there's a mistake, for example, with social media, the people who are making the laws don't understand the problems or don't understand the answers. I think that's an extra layer to the general problem. Yeah, absolutely. Like I, I remember the Facebook Senate hearings that was like, I don't know, 12 old men asking, how does Facebook make money? And I remember Mark Zuckerberg answering ads and, and the senator went like, oh, interesting. I'm going to write that down. And that was about the extent to which they grilled him. So yeah, th there is a divide in the lawmaking side and the people who actually create it. But I hope in time that automatically solves itself, like the dinosaurs go. And I, ho I hope so. I hope so. I don't know. Well, it depends because technology will keep evolving as well. Yeah. So we have to be able to keep up. We might be the old dinosaurs sometime. Yeah, th that's that's a question I've, I've actually been thinking about. Like I considered myself young until a few years ago because I was on Facebook. I was on Twitter, I was on Instagram, but TikTok was my cutoff point. That's where I lost my connection to uh, what was hip or cool at the moment. I mean, I think um, there's always too much. You can't keep up with everything. Um, and so like, yes, I'm letting go of a lot of things, but I still learn a lot of new stuff every day. And so I think I'm okay with that, I guess. But I mean, yeah, I'm definitely not in touch with some of the current like techno culture trends, I guess. My last question is normally for a take home message. All right. So yes, I'll tell you something that I often tell my AI students. So, you know, even with all of the doom and gloom that we talked about, I still find AI really, really exciting. I mean, you know, that's why I'm an AI scientist. And um, I think one of the really fun things about studying intelligence is that we sort of walk around with a case study all the time. Um, and so I'm kind of constantly like thinking about, you know, how I do things. And also um, I read a lot uh, of books. And so one thing I often tell my students is because we're studying human thinking sort of broadly writ, that almost means that, you know, like anything that you read or learn about is going to be 
a commentary on human thinking. So, you know, I love reading, like I mentioned, I love science history because thinking about how scientists think, that's like a really interesting example of intelligence that we don't know how to emulate in our machines yet. Or if you're reading history, you know, that's interesting examples of, you know, I guess you would call that sort of how groups of humans have, you know, like made decisions and interacted with each other over time. And even fiction, you know, I read a lot of fiction and I think it also kind of scratches the same part of my brain as all of these other readings do because, you know, fiction, you know, after all is basically just, you're almost just running thought experiments. It's like, you know, if I put a bunch of these characters in this situation, they're like, what would happen? It's funny because a lot of times students think that you have to only be picking up the CS or AI books off the shelf. Um, But I say, no way, you know, I think you can learn and think about a lot of these interesting things from just about anything that you read. So I think reading widely is what I would recommend. Okay. So keep reading. Yeah. Beautiful sentiment. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. This was the third episode of Apple Finch Pudding. I want to thank Maitili Kunda for the information and uh, Irun Bart for the questions. Let's meet again for the next episode of Apple Finch Pudding.